Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the sixth and final part of France in World War II, uh, which seems to have flown past and a rare Saturday show, which I don't always do. Um, we've tackled France with the regards to Vichy France. We've looked at a figure of the resistance. We've looked at a battle the French participated in North Africa. But today, France is the setting for the story as opposed to being the participant. We're talking about the BEF in 1940 in that late May period which, as you know, I've talked about it before, in late the late May period, everybody's focus is on Dunkirk. Everyone's focus is on those poor souls standing on the mole, standing on the beaches there, the little ships and all that. And it's a brilliant story and it's worth telling. But there's so much else going on in France at the time, including this action we're talking about today, which was occurring in the Ypres Messine area, which, of course, had been fought over a generation before in the First World War, but 1940 saw a very different kind of warfare, albeit in the same locations and in some cases with the very same units, albeit a different generation of people uh, involved. So my guest today um, has an incredibly re a brilliant website. The link is in the description below about this battle, about the Second Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers, but in the context of the rest of the uh, the units that are involved in it. So it's a great website. So if you enjoy this presentation, I urge you to go down there and find and look at this website and look at the amazing resources there. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, introduce my guest. Ian Miskimin is the host of this website. He is the one who's put this all together, and it's my pleasure to introduce him. So good evening, Ian. How are you doing today? Good evening. Very well, thank you very much. Very well indeed. Always enjoyed a nice bit of sunshine today. Oh, Not good. Sure they were uh, enjoying the same sort of weather in uh, 1940 in May, though. Ah, it was a bit rain rainy here in Normandy, but and uh, but the, we're talking about this this these events, which we'll go into in great in detail in a minute. But I, for the benefit of the viewers, where did your interest go into what is, uh, as they will find out, quite a niche and small but very important and very dramatic part of the battles going on in 1940? Your own involvement, where did it come from? Uh, well, I think this really started when I was trying to find out um, a little bit about my great uh, my grandfather. Um, so we applied for his um, service record through the MOD, and it came back with uh, information about the Second Battalion, uh, the Royal Scots Fusiliers. It's got, he's never talked about that. We don't know anything about that. Um, and we tried to have a, a, an understanding about what that was, but there are very few bits of information available. Um, one of the big problems we've had was that in 1940, the records were destroyed without being captured. Uh, and then in the 1980s, early 1980s, there was a fire at the home headquarters which destroyed the second battalion's records. So um, in essence, when I started this bit of research 15, 16 years ago now, um, there was nothing existing apart from a few paragraphs in Colonel Kemp's book on the Ross Scots Fusiliers altogether. Um, and so what it's been, it's been 16 years of hunting down people, talking to relatives, looking at um, diaries, photographs, talking to people on the ground, talking to locals, uh, finding relatives, um, also finding two of the most amazing people I've ever spoken to, uh, Major Livingston uh, and Major Wilmot, both second lieutenants on the day, both alive at the time when I was writing this. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Major Livingston is the only one surviving now. Um, fabulous guy and what was really you know they they've had this incredible history incredible life but all i wanted to do was talk to them about three days um <laughs> which is you know it, it, it's quite frustrating i think for them but very niche and what was beautiful about this is that i don't know whether you you've heard the sort of um when you look at memory loss and dementia and that kind of thing um you can't remember what happened yesterday you can't remember what happened a couple of weeks ago but the period of time between 20 and 25 is where your brain is, is finally putting in all the pieces into the jigsaw puzzle. So those three days to those two guys were absolutely clear in their brains. It was amazing to talk to them. Um, it really was. And I've been lucky enough to, to meet some incredible historians and locals along the way to try and piece this together. Um, so, yeah, it's been a it's been a a good 15 years getting this together and we're still not complete and, and i think you, you know you're saying about the lack of archival information there and the war diaries but in some ways that would have made the what you did 
a more complete picture because sometimes if you have got all the war diaries, that means some authors would just use that as their base and think, well, I've got all that written down and wouldn't necessarily need to go and walk the ground and stand there, as I'm sure you've done, like I've done, not at your particular battlefield, but ones that I, I go to with your compass and your maps and your aerial photos and go, well, can, can, is that that farm there? It must be that farm there. That's that process of working out on the ground is is both very, very rewarding, but it also means you're getting a complete picture because we do have these tools of being able to visit the sites and look at aerial photos and maps and measure things and Google Earth and all those things like that to get those get that complete picture. Yeah, so, what you're finding also is those diaries are very biased because they yeah. weren't written at the time. They were written by the adjutant or whoever it might have been uh, three, four months later along the line, and they might have not have been at that action. Uh, they might have only heard the rosy story of that action. Um, and they're very conflicting. And I've found actually quite a lot of the BEF diaries that I were looking at um, are not concurrent with the um, the memories and the things that happened on the ground. Talking to, to French sources, Belgian sources, German sources, um, it's not how everybody remembers it the same way. And what's really nice is when you get three or four sources and they join up and you yeah. can confirm that one little nugget of information that says, this is it, I know what happened on that day. And, and did you find with the process that it kind of, it felt an uphill struggle and then you get to a point where the dots have connected and you feel you're starting to come down the hill the other side and the last little bit actually seems to go easier because you've 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 accomplished so much and you, and and you realize it's on a downward slope is that is that how it was it what it was like for you yeah i think it is i think getting that framework of the battle together right at the very beginning was the hardest part um mm -hmm. and now it's filling in the final little bits of the jigsaw puzzle finding out who people were and what they looked like because there are no records of who exactly these people were um so you know there are no regimental lists there are no battalion lists of who was there at that time it was all destroyed so having being able to put those final pieces together has been exceedingly difficult there was one or two nuggets right at the very end of the presentation which um i'll share with you which was a it was an absolute golden moment um yeah. of finding a photograph not sure on what that photograph is, somebody local recognizing the photograph of where it is, and then one of the relatives recognizing their father in the photograph of that moment. Oh, amazing. It's been an emotional roller coaster. Wow. Well, um, I have to say, I find people explaining the research process nearly as interesting as the results of the rework research when dr philip blood has been on he explains how he does the research that i find as rewarding as as i say the actual results of it because it's like that kind of director's cut the you know the making of documentary on the dvd or the blu-ray or the kind of behind the scenes yeah. kind of thing that gets gets to understand the process of the historian whether people are professional historians or they have researchers working for whether they're using it doing it with the support of a university or on their own or with an association that process i find really very fascinating so anyway let's move on so i'll hand over to you to kind of get going with things tell me when to click for when i need to but folks we're talking about you know the the, the area northern france very very close to belgium well in fact belgium and france it kind of hovers over over the border there and i'll hand over to ian and then Folks, if you've got questions or comments, you know the score. Please, please uh, put them on the on the uh, in the comments, and we'll put them up on the screen. But Ian, over to you, and let's 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 find out about what the Royal Scots Fusiliers did in the late May 1940. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, sir. Um, so what I need to do is I need to kind of like start the story as the battalion arrives in France in October 1939, um, purely because the lineup between that moment in time and the battle that we come on tells you how that battalion was um, uh, put together, who was left of the battalion from those original people, uh, and the type of people that we got there. So um, they arrived on the 17th of October, um, 1939, from the SS Brighton. You can see a, a photograph there of several of the uh, the Scots Fusiliers having a bit of fun on the, um, uh, on the ship, uh, demonstrating their, uh, their sock prowess. Um, but they arrived there and into Cherbourg, 8.30 on the 19th, and uh, travelled up through um, France, uh, mainly on cattle trucks. Uh, and there's a, a, a Lance Sergeant wrote of this little um, extract 
in his diary for that, uh, describing how the port, when he arrived, was a real pungent smell. Um, and very different people in population and dress and appearance on, uh, from an English port that they'd left behind. And the fact that most of the Fusiliers there, it was their first time arriving in the continent. OK, um, a lot of them had seen service in places like Palestine, uh, some in China, um, some in India. Um, but other than um, a few that had come in from the Dominions, kind of like Canada, Australia and New Zealand, very few had stepped foot on the European mainland um, at all. So this was completely an alien environment for them. Um, but they knew a lot about where their forefathers had fought back in um, the, uh, the last war. So um, they were transported in cattle trucks uh, across the uh, French countryside, arriving in a mining town called Seclin. Um, I'm afraid my pronunciation is probably as bad as anybody else. Uh, and I'm sure everybody's going to jump on my, uh, my, my French there. Um, but it's a mining town, uh, billeted in old brickworks, sleeping on straw, bitter cold winter of 1939-40, and their main task is actually digging trenches and building fortifications along the Belgian frontier. Um, so they're going to be doing that pretty much until um, the 10th of uh, May, when, of course, as we know, the Germans invaded. Uh, the battalion gets their, uh, their orders as part of Plan D, and they get across the border into Belgium. Um, they go through several small battles. And if you want to move on to the, the next slide, their main action that they are being involved in first is the Battle of Arras. OK, now there's loads of books and presentations and things on the Battle of Arras. I'm not going to describe the big battle at all, but purely the bit that the Scots Fusiliers um, will uh, come across. And I'm going to do that for a few of the little extracts from some of the diaries, some of the private diaries as we um, as we go along. So um, you can see or you should be able to see on that. Um, so first click. Hang if on, you can go on first. Let me do that. Whoops, hang on, hang on. There we go, yep. First, first click on the, uh, the mouse. Uh, yep. And we should appear a nice little blue line on Vimy Ridge. Hopefully. Hang on. Okay, no, my apologies. Um, this is the this is the um the setup, isn't it? First. Yeah, that's that's my fault. I I was not looking at the slide properly. I was looking at the screen. <laughs> um, so um, bit of the background about what's going. So the Royal Scots Fusiliers, Second Battalion, are part of Seventeen Brigade. Now, Seventeen Brigade is um, commanded by Brigadier Stopford. Uh, click one more time, and it's made up of the Second Battalion, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, and again. The 6th Battalion Seaforths, which is a territorial battalion, and the 2nd Battalion, the North Hamptonshires. Also within that, click again, um, is that the 2nd Battalion is being um, run by Major Morrison because its CO, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Todd, is currently on leave back in London. So we've already got a, a much reduced force already because a lot of the BEF are going through their leave cycles back in the UK. So one more click for me. So here we are. So um, the battalion, first of all, starts off along with the other two battalions of the um, 17 Brigade up on Vimy Ridge. And on the morning of the 22nd of May, the battalion moves forward to take up positions west of Arras uh, and uh, along the line of the River Scarp, okay, which is supposed to be held by the French but found on arrival that the French are just a, a mere handful of people. So when they come down off of uh, Vimy Ridge, they're heavily impeded by constant aerial attacks. Um, the roads are very much unusable. So instead of approaching along the road in a column, they're coming along the fields in uh, open order. Now an extract here from uh, Lieutenant Livingston Bustle, who is the second in command of uh, D Company, um, reads as follows. So the company fell in at around about 10 o'clock, ready to march off. Um, just as Johnny, who's the company commander, was about to give the order to move, there was a curious whizzing noises and thuds. Okay, These are the shells that are coming down out of the, the sky at that moment in time. Everybody takes cover under some huts uh, and some slip trenches, 
And then five minutes later, it's all quiet. So they move across open country um, down towards Arras. They were halfway there. Um, and there's a French artillery position on their right flank, receives heavier bombardment. Two miles short of St. Catherine's Bridge, the company closes up and marches straight down the road and into St. Catherine's. What's quite interesting in a lot of the, the, the maps on um, this is that um, they show the 17 Brigade and the other brigades much further north from this. Um, but actually, from the local diaries and from the um, from the personal diaries of the people there, they were right down on the bridge, St Catharines, that would go across into the um, into the city. Um, so as they were coming down, they have a, a screen of carriers on the right hand side um, towards um, Marel, which is I'm hoping I've got the pronunciation correctly. Um, and they move further down. So if we go for a, another uh, click on there, and we should be able to see that as they come down there and another one, the Scots Fusiliers are line up along the River Scarp here between St. Catharines and the next small hamlet. Um, click again, and we have the uh, Green Howards on their left flank. Um, there's very few of those, um, and click again, We've got the Seaforths on their right. And again, we have the North Hants in uh, Morel. Um, once again, more clicks. OK, uh, we have the um, 17th Brigade Anti-Tank Company. So around about the time that the BEF went to France, um, most brigades were asked to form an anti-tank company. And they formed, they, they took uh, 10, 15 people from each uh, battalion brought them together, plus some officers, took some transport from each battalions, and they were issued their anti-tank weapons. Um, the commander of the, um, the 17th Brigade anti-tank was a, a guy called Captain Goldie, um, and there's Lieutenant Whitehead there as well, who are two Royal Scots Fusiliers um, people. And click again. So on their right flank, there was a um, the French um, DLM, okay, which is a um, uh, it's their armoured brigade or armoured division. Um, they're in that particular area down there. So by um, um, by ten forty on that day, they're in that village um, along St Catherine's Bridge with the um, Seaforths on their right and they are taking heavy fire heavy artillery fire from the uh, the german forces just, the anti, just that we've got a question there for me and carl what type of uh, weapons do the anti-tank units have is, ah, is it very, rifles? My apologies so the um the anti-tank units here have got the um oh two seconds i'll get you the exact if he's got it in his pocket he knows he's got it lying around in here somewhere I'll get you the exact um two pounders maybe yeah i think it's the two pounders it's the the hotchkiss something or others um two seconds i have it right here in front of me so they have 25 millimeter hotchkiss guns okay okay um and there are so many of those guns so they've got nine of those within the um uh, the anti-tank brigade um, and you know, transported on the the back of the wagons, not particularly well, but they're not a bad weapon for that particular time of the um, um, uh, time of the war. Yeah. So during the uh, the morning, um, what happens is that um, there is. Uh, if you want to do one more click there, there's a, a major German attack forms in on the um, uh, the right hand side, the right flank. Uh, and they start to withdraw, um, which unfortunately is opening up the right flank on the um, uh, on the side of that. And because of that, the brigade has to fall back towards the, there we go, Nivelle. Um, and they use the um, Royal Scots Fusiliers as a pivoting point. So they're now coming in on the road between Arras and, uh, and Suchet. Um, so... It's not a particularly good one, uh, and unfortunately, during this withdrawal, um, the whole brigade is subject to heavy shelling, dive bomb attacks, inflicting many casualties, um, um, and them having to hold that particular 
Um, so yeah, that's light for 1940. Yeah, it's it's a pretty light gun, but it was pretty good for light um, light vehicles. It seemed to work quite well, and they were driving off with multiple shots. Um, they were driving off a lot of the smaller armored vehicles. So at around about um, uh, two thirty in the morning um, on the twenty fourth, the brigade was ordered out of action. Okay. Um, there was no enemy pressure during that darkness, but as soon as uh, light comes along, there's lots of shelling, there's low-flying um, attacks. Uh, during that period, they found that they could um, only move in fits and starts across that area um, because there was a lot of um, fire coming down. So the battalion's withdrawal is very uh, devious route owing to that machine gun fire. Uh, but what is really good is that a guy, so one more click, um, called Lieutenant Thompson, who is in charge of the carrier platoon. And he's mentioned in a lot of the, the, the books and the, the war diaries here, he's mentioned that he did excellent work engaging those enemy machine guns and basically holding the flanks and nursing the entire brigade back towards um, Vimy Ridge. So um, as they come out of there, you find that that action even though they weren't really engaged that heavily in the fight it's caused them quite a few casualties okay and this is why it's important to understand this before we get to the Eves comms canal um is that you think when they're at the, the Eves comms canal they've got a whole brigade and there's lots of people there well actually um the northamptons has taken 350 casualties including their co their two ic the adjutant the rsm OK, so basically half the battalion has ceased to exist for the Northamptonshire um, Regiment. Um, the Seaforths have been really roughly handled as well. They're the reservists. They've taken 150 casualties. Um, quite a few of those casualties that were wounded has been um, they died en route back to um, uh, the UK. Uh, we can trace and track those on the way back. Um, what is frustrating for me is that um, the casualties for the Royal Scots Fusiliers weren't uh, written down anywhere. So mm -hmm. I don't know what was there. Um, there's no real um, detail. The only thing I have got is that there was a constant stream due to heavy shelling and air attacks. Don't know. Um, but what I do know is that Major Adamson, who was the commander of A Company, uh, and Second Lieutenant McDavid of B Company were badly wounded. And there were three casualties, which was Sergeant Murdoch, um, Fusilier Menzies, and Fusilier Gilly. Um, and there were quite a few who were wounded, like Fusilier Barry and Fusilier German, who died of their wounds on the way back through to the UK. Um, it's always tricky in this particular period because uh, records not only of the medical services but also of the battalions themselves are, are lost over time. So um, one point to note is there was a, a really brave uh, guy here called uh, um, um, he was a platoon sergeant major W O three Muc uh, McNamee or McName. Um, the platoon sergeant major rank is one that's probably not familiar with a lot of listeners out there, a W03. Uh, and basically what this was is instead of a young second lieutenant in charge of a, a more technical platoon, which might be um, one of the, the mortar platoons or the anti-aircraft platoons, there was a warrant officer who was um, pinged for becoming an officer eventually, but they were taken on board and used as a platoon commander. Uh, so the platoon sergeant major rank was in there. A lot of those had been withdrawn prior to Arras um, for sending back to the UK to be retrained and commissioned as um, lieutenants. Um, so basically, Mc, uh, McName um, went back to recover a, uh, a guy called uh, Sergeant Murdoch. Uh, he tried to carry him on his back as the company was treated. Unfortunately, uh, they're both hit. Um, um, and he has to leave him behind. Um, Mac name is only lightly wounded, and he tries to go back again with Lieutenant Wallace to try and find the sergeant, but um, the Germans have already taken him, uh, and unfortunately, he dies subsequently of his wounds. Um, but he's got a—he's mentioned much later on, and his um, 
his dedication to his men is something that's quite inspirational. Um, is uh, it shows through later on in what he uh, what he does. So they're being now pushed through to um, uh, back to uh, all the way through to Duai. Uh, so it's uh, lots of route marching, lots of rearguard action. They're being taken out of action. They're now trying to to move backwards. So we're going to move on to the next slide. So the BEF is having a lot of troubles here. So um, as the evacuation of Arras and everybody's moving out of there, the night of the 23rd of May, 24th of May, you can see it contracting towards Dunkirk. Calais is already under siege at this moment in time. And the decision is taken at some point that we need to hold a line um, running through Eaps, comms, uh, and back towards Dunkirk um, to ensure that whatever is left of the British Expeditionary Force can be evacuated. But you'll remember that um, Lieutenant Colonel um, William Todd, the CEO of the 2nd Battalion, Robert Woodward, is um, still in London. Okay, and when he hears that the, um, the Low Countries have been invaded on the 10th of May, he goes off to find the War Office and says, you know, what can I do? Um, and we have his story, which is, it's a boy's own adventure. It is phenomenal, his story of getting back to the battalion. Um, I found this in a letter written by him after the war. His handwriting is absolutely appalling. So some of it, I've got no idea what it says, but basically um, he's saying here that um, when his leave is over, he got over to Cherbourg. In Cherbourg, there are hundreds of officers, uh, men of different units. Amongst them, he found the CEO of the Cameronians and um, the two IC of the Wiltshires that he knew personally. And he's told that the troops in Cherbourg were to remain there, so there's no transportation. But basically what he does, is he goes to the commandant of Cherbourg and says, I need to get to Dunkirk. I need to get to go and find my men. Uh, and they find him a uh, motor transport, um, sorry, motor torpedo boat, and the skipper agrees to take him to Dunkirk. So they make their way towards Dunkirk in the motor torpedo boat. Um, they get bombed and strafed by lots of aircraft. Um, there's lots of shore battery um, action. They're getting fired on all the way along the coast. And as they get near to Dunkirk, the sea's covered with wreckage of all kinds. Uh, from bits of bombs out ships, from aircraft to people. Uh, it's pretty horrific stuff. Um, the skipper of the MTB stops uh, and searches for um, uh, uh, survivors. They don't find any. They're getting uh, bombed by a German plane and they have to sit there without the engines on to stop the wake from showing them off. Uh, they eventually get to Dunkirk and they have to uh, basically bribe somebody um, to get a car to drive them towards their units. And they go for the next oh, next day or so, driving around from village to village to village, asking people, where is my unit? How can I get there? And they eventually find uh, this guy, Captain Butterfield, who is another fusilier, but he's the 5th Division liaison officer, um, being very cool and collected, another one of these inspirational people. Um, and he tells them about the action in Arras and that they've been sent well south of Lille. Uh, and then they can actually find them somewhere near Seclin. Um, and what was really interesting at the end of his letter, the end of his story, he just says, oh, that ends the story of not a, uh, of a not a very thrilling journey. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's, that's a once in a lifetime journey. But this guy is a seasoned veteran. He's a First World War veteran. He was captured by the Germans in the First World War. Um, so he'd spent most of the uh, 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 the war behind the wire um, in Germany. Um, and then he's back here again with uh, the battalion. So on to the next slide. So with all briefings, we've got to tell you a little about the situation, uh, friendly forces and the situation enemy forces. What you can see in front of you is the um, the, the kind of like the, the officers and the platoon commanders, whether that is the uh, platoon sergeant majors or um, second lieutenants, et cetera, et cetera, um, of the battalion. Over the years, when I've been doing my research, I have found all these people. Um, there was no list to begin with. 
So I had to put together a family tree right at the very beginning um, and then try and fit faces to people. And there are two people I can't find, even after 16 years, I cannot find. And if anybody has a photograph of Lieutenant Clark, who was the medical officer, um, or Lieutenant, or uh, Second Lieutenant McIntosh, um, OC 16 platoon, then I would love you to be able to tell me um, that you've got a photograph and, and send me one. Um, it will be fantastic because McIntosh is a real character. Um, I recognize him as very much of a, a very young man, very unsure, very nervous, uh, not really, you know, in his in the right place at the right time, uh, making lots of mistakes, but doing the best he can. And unfortunately, he gets wounded uh, later on in the action. Um, and that's the last we see of him. I, I, I can't find any records of him at all, uh, which is most frustrating. So on to the next uh, one. Situation enemy forces. So the enemy forces here are made up of the 18th and the 31st Infantry Divisions. OK, the 18th is commanded by Major General uh, Frederick Karl Kranz, um, and that is comprised of the 54th, the 51st and the 30th Infantry Regiments. And then the 31st Infantry Regiment Division, um, commanded by uh, General Lieutenant Kampf, um, which is comprised of the 12th, 17th and 32nd Infantry Regiments. OK, so the Germans, um, their divisions and regiments are slightly different from ours. So each infantry division would have had approximately about 17,200 men, which is quite considerable. And their main effort is to support the fighting power of the three infantry regiments of 3,250 men. OK, so the infantry regiment has typically three battalions of uh, 700 men each made up of three rifle companies, as well as um, headquarters, signals, pioneer, anti-tank, machine gun supply units. Um, and also within those regiments, we have um, you know, recce, signals, artillery, engineer battalions. They really do get um, this whole joint um, services thing. OK, uh, it really is very, uh, very, very good. Now, when we come to um, uh, this particular units that are involved, they have been shuffled around a little bit um, because of the casualties they've already taken. Um, but the casualty numbers have been backfilled, but the units have changed. A um, lot has been written over the years about the weapon systems used by both sides. OK, a lot of people uh, always tell you that the German weapon systems were far in advance of the British. Uh, I don't really see that. I see us as very much evenly matched with small arms. OK, I think the only real difference is the uh, the machine pistol, you know, the machine pistol 38, the MP38 mm -hmm. by infiltration troops. Um, great in short range snap contacts. Um, we don't really have anything equivalent in the British Army at that moment in time. Um, and then looking at support weapons, we really failed in the British world to train and equip with mortars. Um, the records show that the Fusiliers sent their mortar tubes back for maintenance work before Arras, and they never saw them again. Um, so the mortar platoon was just used as backfillers for the infantry platoon, which really, when you look at how the Germans used mortars within this environment, phenomenal. Okay, they, they really could do accurate. You said it earlier, Ian, but it's it's not that their weapon systems are better, it's their infrastructure and the support and their combined arms approach yeah. and the air support. And some you know, JD from History Underground has already said, I guess there's not much air support for the British around our ass. They go, Well, no, not really. It's gonna be what there is is gonna be up near Dunkirk or, or, yeah. or elsewhere. They're just the Germans have that ability to bring in air power, they've got more coordinated, and as we always say, we said it on the uh, the, the show with Matthew Powell. When we talk about Kadarian as a tanker, he's a he's a radio, he's an artillery, sorry, a radio signals guy first who knows how to use tanks. And it's the communications, I always think, is the absolute ace up the German sleeve, not so much weapon by weapon. He's, you know, they're going down a rabbit hole, but the French tanks of that era were perfectly good yeah. and service better than some of the German tanks. It's always about the infrastructure and the support the Germans had able to set up that the British and the French are, alas, uh, sorely lacking at this time. Oh, every time. And we, we still do. So um, I'm a, a regimental signals warrant officer. I still feel that our communications systems and our communications capabilities 
are appalling compared to um, what they should be uh, and what we want them to be. You think of all the, the modern technologies that we're trying to use, the scanners, the drones, the, all that wonderful stuff. It all takes huge amounts of data being transmitted backs and forwards. And unless you have that data or that information or that communications in time for you to tactically use it, it's pointless. As yeah, Sheldrake says there, communications are key. British yeah. communications during this are appalling. And that's why those infiltration tactics work really well. And we'll see their impact a little bit later. Um, because the per people in the, share the foxholes, the forward platoons, they don't have communications apart from runners between them and what's behind them. And as soon as those infiltration units get through, you know, one or two people with an MP38 and a rifle um, suddenly becomes a, a company with snipers and they're behind me and, oh, they're not isolated. The front line hasn't crumbled, but actually what you feel like in that foxhole is it has. So then you retreat, you fall back because there's no communications telling you, no, it's all right. They haven't broken through. Stay where you are. Yeah, so, uh, it's, 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 yeah. it's an integrated, connected system that they're sorely lacking. And Ian Carr, yeah. uh, just uh, ask at, at a higher level, because we talked about the brigade. Who is who is in, is controlling the Royal Scots Fusiliers at a kind of a operational level? Um, so obviously, Brigadier Stockford is the uh, the main person there. Um, he's he's fighting all three battalions, um, but it's Lieutenant Colonel Todd who's making all the tactical decisions on the ground. He He's deciding where things are placed within the battalion. And, and they have kind of autonomy within that? Because obviously, you know, you've got Lord Gort is in Dunkirk. And is there much of a sort of a coordinated uh, response at a higher level? When Matthew Powell was on on Tuesday talking about the Royal Air Force, he was talking about the the the, the difficulties of coordinating all those things at that kind of general general's level. Um, so in this situation, is it more autonomy at a lower level? I think there is more autonomy at a lower level on, on this one, uh, purely because a brigadier can't be there to place individual uh, shell scrapes. He can't be there to, to, to place an individual gun position. You've got to trust your subordinates. You've got to be able to go, right, I want you between this village and this village to form a line. How you do it is up to you. I might tell you that I want two up and one back, which is, you know, two, um, uh, two companies forward on one in reserve, but I might not give you any other information apart from that. Mm. And it's, 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 yeah. I think the, the units that were really advanced in this is the, um, the artillery in this particular battle. And it's shown all the way through the BEF that the British artillery was way in advance of the Germans in this world. It was very well coordinated. It was very well trained. It was very professional. Um, they had incredible um, suppressive firepower to be able to call down at very short notice with really good accuracy, which the Germans didn't have. I mean, the Germans as a whole were, were running short of ammunition by the time you get to this battle on this. So they're not using the full weight of their artillery yet. The British artillery really is going for it. They've got motorised tractors. They've got an abundance of ammunition, well-trained professional force. Um, but their one biggest drawback here is from above because yep. the RAF really isn't there. So every time you stop your gun, you've got to put your, uh, your your camouflage cover and up. You've got to make sure it's all concealed. It's all dug in. Then you can fire your rounds, but then you've got to move on once again. Yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, it, it, it's not particularly good. The the Scots Fusiliers themselves relied mainly on flags, signal lamps, and telephone lines. Um, I can't find any records of any communications equipment radio for the Scots Fusiliers. I can find nothing. If there is some, then I'd love to find it. But over the the sixteen years. I found nothing. So I can only presume that they're still using signal lamps, flags, runners, 
and telephone lines. Which, as which is, uh, as Sheldrake says there, is indicative of the fact that the British Army aren't expecting at this time the kind of mobile war that's happening around them. They're, they've gone there maybe with a more of a First World War mentality. We'll have time to get lines up, set the telephone lines out, have people working on the system out, telephone exchanges, all that. And and this 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 it's not quite blitzkrieg in this area but it's it's part of a of an overview of blitzkrieg is rather rather changing the game somewhat but i feel we must i'm loving it but i think we should move on um because yeah, my fault asking questions and stuff like that let's let's talk about <laughs> let, let's move on okay no worries so we start our narrative at around about six o'clock um bst in a small wood uh southeast of santa light called waste Fezel. OK, what you can see uh, on your map there is if you see the word Palingbeek, that's it. So Palingbeek down, see if you zoom in on there, you see Palingbeek yeah, yeah. there. And then there's an oblong wood, uh, which your hand is on right now. That is the Boise de Faison, the, uh, the wood of the pheasants. OK, uh, and this is right on a road that the First World War was uh, bordered on. OK, um, called uh, something called the Damastraus, which is the sunken road. OK very famous within that world um, and that's where that particular um, uh, 17 Brigade meet up. So the advanced party of 17 Brigade um, are in those woods. We've got Brigadier Stockford, uh, we've got Lieutenant Colonel Buffy who's the commander of 91 Field Regiment which is the Royal Artillery and we've got Major Hewitt who is the commander of the 206 Anti-Tank Battery who is the, um, the, the commander um, of that um, particular uh, force of, I think there are 18 pounders. Um, they go forward to recce the positions because they've been asked to do so by the brigadier. Um, they look at that along, uh, they look at the map. You can see that map on the left-hand side is the GSGS 40 map, okay? That's the one they're given. Um, the problem is you can see on there that that canal looks like a, a really good stop line. It's not. Parts of it have got water in, parts of it are just a muddy ditch. Other bits have got nothing in it at all. So actually, there's no stop line there whatsoever. And if you look onto the, the right there, where your hand is right now, oh, yeah, go back into there. Um, what you can see is that that railway line coming from the top, from Zvatlin all the way down, is on an embankment. So actually, what you're doing is you're lining your troops up behind that canal behind an embankment so you can't see what's on that opposing slope very well um, so as a defensive line it's absolutely appalling however it's the defensive line the same defensive line that the same battalion so the second battalion the Royal Scots Fusiliers took up in 1914 all those years ago beforehand so um, in the symmetries around that area Whilst these people, the Scots Fusiliers, are marching towards this battle, um, they're marching through the cemeteries with their cat badge on and their father's names on those gravestones. Which is isn't that absolutely incredible? Isn't I mean, just the, the, the what the chances of being in the same area in the same positions, facing almost the same directions with the same names, it's yeah. it's extraordinary. And, and doing the, 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 unfortunately, with the same outcome. Um, I believe yeah, yeah. 790 went into the action in 1914, uh, and I think 100 got out from there, and the rest were either killed or, or captured, um, which is sobering when you think the same lessons are going to happen all over again. If you zoom back in on that map very briefly again, um, what you can see up near Zvatlin there, the the... Uh, village just below there there's an l i'm um, sorry just below there there's the railway line and that is a place called hill 60 okay it goes through famous 1914 to 1918 war um, what's interesting here is that in the first world war the front lines were um east west whereas the front lines in the second world war are north south okay going through exactly the same hill we're using the same bunkers we're using the same trenches that were there in 1918 which is it's bone chilling really um when we come to this so um if you zoom back out again we're just going to place all our pieces on the uh the screen so um so if you give us a oh i've just lost the screen there we go if we place the click so the headquarters unit is there and they're sorting themselves out uh, major hewitt um looks at the area around looks at the fact that there's anti-tank obstacles in the woods um, there's a place called Battle Woods, 
which you can just see uh, near Klein Zillabeek um, and Hill 60 there on the uh, the bigger map on the right hand side. Um, that anti-tank ditch, incredibly enough, was dug by um, uh, Spanish. Uh, Spanish Civil War um, um, refugees were helping to dig that. And what was really nice is I talked to the lady who father built the Hill 60 Cafe, Annie Moon. She's 97, 98, something like that. Um, and she remembers the Spanish digging the, um, the ditch. And she also remembers seeing all the soldiers arriving for this particular battle before they took um, uh, cover in the tunnels below Hill 60 was wow. where they took shelter. Um, and just briefly, folks, we did a show with Sean Scullion back in August or September about the Spanish volunteers of the British Army. And this subject of them digging trenches up in 1940 did come up if i recall briefly in that show there so go back and check that one back to you ian brilliant so um they've noticed that they've got some really good natural anti-tank ditches as well uh of the railway um embankment and the cutting running past hill 60. um the bridge over the railway to hill 60 collapsed many many years ago making it impossible for vehicles so actually it's quite a good um defensive line so um, the um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Buffy places his, um, understands what he, where he needs to go. Um, he conducts his reconnaissance and places 91 and 18 field regiments of all artillery down on the road. So one more click. So they are placed on the road between Santa Loy down to Oosterveen. Um, and where are we there we go okay um and they take their main position they put a, a position into um uh, verband and molen for their observation post in the windmill weirdly enough you've got a place there called the burnt mill and that's where they put the um the op so um second battalion the royal scots fusiliers which is the next click takes up a position uh, along the railway line with on their left flank the six seaforths next click and Back in reserve is the second North Hans. Now, one company of the North Hans is taken up and put between Zillabeek and Zillabeek Lake briefly before 150 Brigade turn up uh, a little bit later. OK, but for the purposes of this, they're back there on something that the First World War people would recognise is something called the Bluff. OK, mm. if you look back in your First World War history, the Bluff is a major area that gets fought over time and time again. It really dominates that area. Um, OK, so next click. What we have also is a um, uh, two platoons of machine guns from the first night Manchester's and they're placed in the upper floors of three farmer houses within this area where they're able to provide sustained fire um, for any withdrawal and also to support the forward positions. I was lucky enough that one of those farm farmhouses that the Manchester's are in, um, I met the guy who, um, who lives there, and he's helped me with the history of that area. He's a First World War historian, so he's very, very useful to, uh, to know in that context. Uh, next click. So there we go. And to cover the slightly open uh, left flank on there, we have the 17 Brigade um, anti-tank company. And the next one. So medical services, we've got a, a whole stream here. Back um, here around uh, Vermazil, we have 141 Field Ambulance under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Hankey. Um, they set up a casualty clearing post in uh, a place called the Vergote Farm, which is very important to our story later on, and we'll come back to that. Um, they're fed by a regimental aid post, which is much further forward um, which is where the Manchester's have set up their uh, machine gun post as well. So the casualty collection point will be where the ambulance which is ambulances would collect the wounded and take them back um, to the advanced dressing stations back further on towards uh, Vermazil for triage and evacuation. Um, and finally, we've got some of B Company's transport back there as well. So we've got the guns of 206 there, all lined up as well in Pallingbeek. And to our left, um, sorry, to our right flank, we have uh, 13 Brigade. So next click going down there. Brilliant. OK. Um, and that is um, their position is the right flank. 
They are the second um, Royal Inniskinning Fusiliers with another formation of the Manchester's machine guns. Um, and that is run by, um, uh, who is he? I had him written down in one of my notes. I'll come back to him later on from the- It'll uh, come to you later. It'll come to me. Um, but basically, um, whilst this strategy has been working, worked out, the wood is attacked by 27 um, high core bombers. Okay, doesn't cause any casualties, but what it does do is it makes people um, scatter and get a move on. So it's a little bit confused, a little bit um, uh, rushed to get people out of the door. So how do we set up the, um, the, the, the battlefield in front of us? So imagine this at the moment, um, it's raining heavily, um, there are lots of um, still um, uh, debris from the First World War. There are still, uh, there's plenty of Commonwealth War Graves Commission um, grave sites around. There is still names and places that you recognise from the First World War. So this is not particularly looking like a, a, a good uh, place to be. Um, looking at the canal, once again, it's not a great stop line. We haven't got good lines of sight. Um, we're not finding a particularly good area to um, defend. So let's have a look in more detail where the companies are before we start the battle. So next slide. So this is a company, okay? Um, they're on the left flank uh, and they're centered around Hill 60. A company is led by somebody called Lieutenant Wallace who um, has taken over because um, the CO was wounded at our ass, Major Adamson. Um, we have Acting Lieutenant Sinton as his 2IC, uh, Platoon Sergeant Major Cruz, and 2nd Lieutenant Calderwood, who's commanding 9 Platoon. Their positions are set up around Hill 60, um, and they have to evacuate some civilians who are hiding in the bunkers on Hill 60 as they are. Okay. Their headquarters unit is set up on the southern side of the railway cutting, right in something called um, uh, the crater, okay, the Caterpillar Crater, which is a huge mine explosion crater that you see still during your walks around Hill 60 area from the, uh, the First World War. Um, so further back behind there, we have something called a fighting patrol, okay? Um, the fighting patrol, which in essence is seven to two, um, is led by somebody called Lieutenant uh, Chongli. Um, he's a 30-year-old supplementary reserve officer. He's from Australia and spent many years prospecting in um, uh, South America and around the world. Very tough, very resourceful character. This platoon is held back slightly further into wood, the woods because it's made up of the, the slightly more aggressive, the younger, the fitter um, troops who are going to be carrying out the fighting patrols um, basically they're there to cause as much disruption and carry out those raids in static trench warfare one of their main jobs was to locate enemy positions and um, they were looking to um, understand where the artillery concentrations are so they could be passed back to 91 and 18 field regiments um, I know when, when you say how do you get this amount of detail on things it really is 16 years of talking to everybody who's there plus what was really interesting was being able to get um transcripts from the german forces who were there because they were recorded by the person who owned the house uh, who went around and talked to everybody he interviewed everybody at the end of the battle which was it's unheard of this level of detail that you can get out of this um phenomenal it really is um so Next slide. So we look now at B Company. We have um, Second Lieutenant uh, Bowlby and Second Lieutenant Robertson platoons taking up the four positions along the railway. 11 platoon on the um, uh, platoon sergeant Major Gregory, um, further back held in reserve. Their position is stretched up to the point where the major track runs through the park there and stops are out 25 meters short of the railway embankment. You can still see most of that track today, and you can also still see where the anti-tank ditch was dug at the end of that track um, to make up for where the wood transects through there and also where the embankment comes through. Um, 
So B Company and the forward elements of headquarters company are taking up residence within this park here. So you've got headquarters taking up into a house. A lot of their transportation is in there. And what's really interesting about some of this is some of the photographs you see of 1938, 39, which is one of the ones you can see there. That's standing on Hill 60, looking back through the park. Um, and you can see the roof of the house that is being taken up by headquarters company. What was really important about photographs like this is because I needed to understand the ground that they were on. How tall were the trees? How much had regrown since 1918? Mm -hmm. I really got to understand that to understand how people infiltrated. The woods there, really young trees, um, really easy to hide in and to move through like that, but almost impossible to defend because you can't see anybody around you. Losing communications with people left and right of you, you can't see more than a couple of metres within that kind of undergrowth. So really difficult to uh, to defend along that area. So um, <clears throat> the forward elements of headquarters company taking up residence in the old house there, occupied during this battle by the park ranger. He's a guy called Polydor. He's a bit of a simple character, but he also recorded his thoughts about this battle, which is a gold mine of information. Um, so this house has several large barns around. The company are, are cooking rations there, storing spare ammunition, parking up the uh, the A company, uh, sorry, the um, A echelon transportation. And headquarters company is around about 200 drivers, cooks, signalers, pioneers, batman, orderlies, mortarmen, anti-tank riflemen, many, many more people split between here and back across the canal at the Virgo farm. Um, a good proportion of the battalion's wheeled transport um, uh, took over the buildings in the centre of this park and the administrative platoon sets up their temporary store and cookhouse. Um, it's interesting to note that whilst the 1st of the 9th Battalion, um, the Manchesters, were, were balancing their machine guns back in the park, um, they, miss, um, uh, they misfire and the shots drop short through the roof of one of those buildings, causing one of the first casualties to the Scots Fusiliers for this particular um, battle. Oops. So, next slide. Once again, move further along the railway here, we've got um, C Company occupying the right flank of the battalion. The commanding officer is Captain Ellis, and their 2IC is Lieutenant Green. Um, interesting guy, Captain Ellis. Um, it's not his real name. Um, I can't give you his real name, but he was called Comrade Ellis uh, mm. as a, a bit of a joke. And before the um, invasion of Norway, the battalion was tipped to be a um, reinforcements for Estonia and Latvia against the Russians, weirdly enough. Um, and they told um, Captain Ellis this, Comrade Ellis this, and he was mortified that he'd be going up against his fellow Reds as such. Um, whether this is true or not, but this was one of the stories told to me uh, by uh, one of the survivors. Wow. Um, so, but anyway, that came to nothing because, um, you know, basically Poland was, was finished within a very short amount of time and um, the, uh, the Norwegian campaign uh, started up and everybody got shuffled around again uh, and then... That didn't last long either. So um, a good proportion of the battalion's wheel transport is in those buildings. Um, sorry, we're now into to C Company here. Um, so they're missing one of the platoon commanders, Lieutenant Thompson. Um, so this is another Thompson. He's gone sick earlier. So we've got that platoon sergeant major taking over. Um, so we have platoon sergeant major Thompson rather than Thompson, which is the second lieutenant, slightly confusing, of course. Um, but we've got second lieutenant Marshall and second lieutenant Wilmot in there. Wilmot was one of the guys that I managed to talk to. Um, fabulous guy, um, uh, major, went through the rest of the war. Uh, very, very good. Um, so, and at the end of that flank, what we've got is one of the big bunkers. If you're driving around that area, as you're driving along that road, over the uh, the canal, you can see one of the big bunkers. You can you can see that in that photograph in the bottom left hand corner. That's the photo. That's the bunker you can see by the side of the road, um, and that bunker was full of beer and the owners of the Entrepot Cafe. 
Um, so the uh, Manchester's and um, the Ines Killens had to set up on top of that. That photograph is really interesting because it was taken during the battle. Um, hence was also there was another photograph further back of some Germans with a machine gun that was taken during the battle. I found a book uh, published in 1941 by the division that um, took part in the battle and they published photographs and an incredible script. It was very political, very, um, you know, we're the, the master race type stuff um, mm. and written in a, in a gothic script, which was impossible to read. Wow. Um, but eventually I translated enough of it to get a lot of the, the German story out the back end of it as well. So anyway, um, so it's a major strong point, gave commanding views across the side there. And if you see on the right hand side of that map, that is a, a, a gentle slope that runs down towards the railway. OK, so from that machine gun position, you can cover a very large area and cause a lot of um, casualties. So next slide. So this is back towards the middle with D Company. D Company uh, come across the canal, hooked right, set up in the woods there to cover any positions in depth and also any chance that we needed to um, retreat across. Uh, Carriers set up within the farm in the centre of our battlefield and then the regimental aid post along with Manchester's machine guns um, set up there as well. So you can see a, a picture of the, the farm there in the 1960s, but the farm uh, is actually really interesting. Um, sorry, this is another aside. The kitchen kept collapsing because it's falling into the German trench from the First World War uh, wow. underneath the, uh, the, the kitchen. Wow. It, it's a phenomenal building and the fact that it's seen both conflicts uh, and taken part in both was was quite um quite amazing really um so yes you've got um captain vaughan um and um lieutenant livingston bustle uh, also in there is lieutenant livingston who was my uh my main contact for all of this um uh, and a man with an incredible memory next slide so this is back where the headquarters units are. Um, we are looking here at the Vergote farm is where uh, battalion headquarters and the casualty collection point is. Uh, we've also got the four guns of 206 anti-tank, um, which are the 18 pounders um, of uh, First World War fame, I believe. Um, and we have the Pioneer Platoon, the Mortar Platoon, um, set up across the canal to guard the two um, little creeks that go across the uh, pitch menu and the pitch or the gu de Palimbique. They're two little streams that run across, um, which are the, the, the crossing points within that canal. Um, otherwise, it's just a boggy morass uh, within this moment in time. Now, the Signals Platoon is set up in a big house with a white house. Okay. Famous house during the First World War. Once again, this house is um, uh, is an incredible building. It's a golf course now, um, but it's an incredible building because it was rebuilt after the First World War. The original White House was actually, if you look directly above there, there's a purple dot where a bunker is. Okay, um, within the um, on the map. Um, there is a so if you your if your pointer goes up a bit right a bit oh there we are yeah absolutely. Uh, okay just in there that's the original white house is in those woods and the cellars and some of the buildings are still in there um right now even though this whole area has been re-landscaped as a golf course which completely wow. threw my research off oh, oh it was terrible because it's uh, the field systems have gone the levels have gone the buildings have changed the farm the vergote farm phew, vanished vanished um and i was very lucky to find that photograph from the 1970s um to understand how it was constructed but anyway um you've got the signals platoon in there with their flags and their lights um which was um a cross to be able to uh, to signal to the four companies and you've got our colonel todd uh the rsm burr captain arkwright captain arkwright an incredible guy um absolutely amazing this, this read his book on how he escapes from prisoner of war camps comes back joins the commandos and starts to, to heap his revenge on everybody um yeah brilliant brilliant bloke next slide 
So in this house, the, um, the, the White House, there is the Cossart family. And Jacques Cossart here is also another one of my uh, resources. He interviewed the Germans, the locals, and collected a massive amount of information and stored it. Um, and it was in some sort of, it was in a Flemish um, uh, French, a very, um, almost like an aristocratic French. So it was very difficult to translate. Um, you, you can tell I took years translating this with Google and Babelfish and things like that. I just, mm. my, my language is uh, uh, appalling. But anyway, so the family were living at the house at the time and they were evacuated just um, uh, down into the basements. Um, and that's where they stood for the whole uh, battle. Yeah, next slide. So here we go. At four o'clock on the 26th of May, uh, the German um, 18th Infantry Division appears to the front of the Royal Scots Fusiliers um, and across the front of the Inniskillings, and they're proceeding from right to left. So they're heading towards uh, Le Zillabic Lake. The first units are motorcycles, horses, armored cars, reconnaissance units, numerous mounted bicycle troops, uh, and they are taken under fire from artillery of all sizes. Okay, but they just keep coming. Uh, shortly after this, the 54th Jaeger Infantry Regiment, which is part of the 18th, come down and start setting up their support weapons in Klein Zillebeek, uh, and they're making their approaches towards the railway um, through a place called Fusilier Wood. So another couple of interesting photographs here. The one on the right-hand side here is very interesting to me. We've got Fusilier Wood to the left of these machine gunners. You can see Battle Wood uh, in front of these gunners okay and just slightly to the right is hill 60 these are the fields see that there's a, a star on the um on the the map above it that's where this photograph is being taken from it's incredible to find photographs from the german side of this particular action which yeah. is uh, is great anyway zoom back out again on there so um they're giving them uh, covering fire. They set up in Svartlin their 34 MG 34s, the 51 millimeter mortars, the 81 millimeter mortars. Um, they're taking the mill under fire because they've identified that as the observation post for the British artillery, um, and they're now starting to bring in their medium and heavy guns. So next slide. And Sheldrake is just asking, how long did the fuse layers have to dig in? Was it about a day? <laughs> Not even a day. Half a I mean, day. literally, I knew it was less than a day. Yeah. Literally, they got there late afternoon on the twenty sixth, um, and here's the Germans arriving at four o'clock on the sixth. So they've had probably about two or three hours. Okay, two or three hours. Away. Okay, a day would have been a day would have been a great. Okay, yeah. So it, it really is this fast things are happening. Uh, there is no time to do uh, very much at all. Um, so as the afternoon of the 26th uh, progresses, the Seaforths on the left are put under immense pressure um, through artillery, positions in um, uh, snipers and infiltration. Um, and the problem with the Seaforths, and they come in for a lot of flak later on, um, after uh, BF and, and Dunkirk, etc., and, and back in the UK, there I think their commanding officer is the only commanding officer, their only colonel, um, that the only colonel from the BEF that is court-martialed for his um, actions within wow. uh, that time. Um, but I feel sorry for them. They are a, a reservist unit. Um, they're not particularly well trained. They're thrown into this. They've been through a lot of um uh action at arras they've lost 150 of their people a lot of their hierarchy um they've been pulled from pillar to post they're hungry they're cold they're wet and they're actually now got the best part of an infantry regiment coming down on their single battalion um the defenses here are minimal um so you can see why they've started to uh, to buckle so as we get towards the night of the 26th, um, we have um, Colonel Todd says, right, we've got to get out some fighting patrols. We've got to find out where the artillery is, where the Germans are dug in. We need to know exactly what's against us. And he sends out um, Lieutenant, 2nd Lieutenant Chumley and 2nd Lieutenant Robertson 
Um, the fighting patrol goes out, and so does the uh, temper team uh, patrol. Now, he's worked as um, Chumley sent, worked in South Africa as a miner. He's a very resourceful person. He knows he's a natural leader of men. Like he's very comfortable in the field, very comfortable leading the fighting patrol. Um, so the fighting patrol starts out at uh, around about quarter to nine. We found um, a, a note taken from uh, this is a uh, this is it's an interesting one. The parish records of all the various uh, areas have got some of the grave goods from the people that were killed. And some of the text has been recorded from some of those things into those things. So we've got a, a record of what the fighting patrol did, uh, which is quite interesting from a few of his uh, penciled notes. So uh, at uh, quarter to nine, um, Second Lieutenant Chumley and 14 men crossed the steep embankment of the railway through eight companies' positions. They made their way through the back gardens and houses as Vartaline, which is opposite, crossing the main road as the light started to fade. It's been raining heavily all evening, and they moved along either side of a wide track heading northeast towards Hill 62 and the Canadian Memorial. What was interesting was because of the efforts of um, the Royal Artillery, the 54th Infantry Regiment pulls back slightly at eight o'clock that night, 20, 100 hours, because there's heavy shelling uh, and they need to just give themselves a bit of uh, a break, which allows the patrols to pass through them without any incident. Um, so they're moving through the trees. The report says that they can hear noises of horses and vehicle movement, um, that they here yeah, the um the ten and a half centimeter horse drawn light field howitzers from the seventh battery um of the 18th infantry division and the second battery which are the 15 centimeter model 18 howitzers um they can hear them setting up and they report that back um, they can see red flares to the south which indicating that the german infantry is moving back in behind them and as they move through the wood uh, just after midnight um they surprise two german soldiers okay one they kill which is uh a gunner hans luch slager um, and the other they take prisoner i can find no record of what happens to the prisoner but i do know that that particular gunner was temporarily buried uh, by that wood um the particular information they got from there proved to be a crucial success because it pinpointed where the divisional artillery was and they could pass that back to the intelligence officer, which was uh, Second Lieutenant Maitland McGill Crichton. They finally passed back through uh, Fusilier Wood, uh, contracting through C Company at around about um, 0120 hours. Uh, the other patrol by um, Second Lieutenant Robertson, um, unfortunately, uh, was a much different story. They were trapped behind the German infantry uh, and they were forced to surrender. The story didn't come out until the end of the war. Um, wow. But we know that now. Uh, they didn't know it at the time. So whilst those were behind that, um, so uh, there were lots of machine gun fire and artillery fire coming down on those um, uh, those areas. Um, during one of those attacks, it was Corporal Barnes, one of the section commanders, was killed, um, and... Um, which led to the section from uh, B Company withdrawing without any orders. Luckily enough, we had a guy called um, uh, Fusilier Murphy, took command of the section, personally repositioned them, um, and made sure that they were okay during the remaining hours of darkness because of that really difficult communications within those woods. Um, he was um, gained a citation for the military medal for that. Okay. Um, and then he was asked, the following day to carry messages for the um, the commander. Uh, also, because the second lieutenant Robertson failed to return, Sergeant Carr uh, also distinguished himself um, by taking command of the platoon and awarding a citation for the DSO. Fantastic guy, really, really good. So, next slide. Sorry, I'm probably going to be waffling on a bit longer than the the time we've got. Alligator. Well, people are enjoying it. Yeah, we are. We are. We're getting to kind of epic movie length. It's Lawrence, It's going to be Lawrence of Arabia tonight, not one of those little TV, but it's good. Yeah, people are enjoying it, and and it. We we are privileged Ian, to be witness to this 16 years of research because it's it's just incredible. It's uh, the detail is just outstanding. Well, we'll keep going until people get bored. 
Um, <laughs> my apologies. Um, so um, whilst this is happening, um, so you've got the, the two um, citations there for uh, Carr for his, sorry, Distinguished Conduct Medal, um, and also from um, Fusilier Murphy. So those slides will be um, available uh, if anybody wants them. So we'll just keep moving from that. So, okay. Um, whilst this is happening, um, B Echelon Stores and the M2 Platoon knows nothing of the intensity along there. Um, they're dispatching stores and ammunition across there. The second Lieutenant um, Kemp Thorne and Lieutenant Shakespeare are, are doing that. That's the M2 and the Assistant MTO. They are um, going back and forth on their motorbikes, making sure things are right, delivering stuff through the, um, the, the lorries. Okay. Um, but they do get a few telltale signs to know that all is not well. So Lieutenant Kemp Thorne's um, uh, diary here says that um, while um, uh, Shakespeare and I were eating, Battalion Butcher suddenly appeared at our table. He saluted smartly with a chicken bone in his spare hand, announcing, Sir, I beg to report that I have seen a spitfire. And he had indeed. This was the first and last we saw in the whole campaign. So the Air Force was there. Um, uh, and they managed to borrow a radio from one of the local Belgian farmers, listen to the reports um, that the BF had been surrounded and they were evacuating out through Dunkirk. They, when they were driving down the roads there, they were seeing a few um, vehicles that were being smashed up with sledgehammers, um, slashing tyres, wrecking vehicles. Other units were starting to prepare their vehicles for a mass uh, retreat out and away to Britain. Um, and they were told that there should be no way any attempt to drive the trucks back from where they were. Um, next slide. So as light returned, um, so did the ability for the artillery on both sides. British concentrating their counter battery fire to help relieve pressure on the front lines. Um, and the information delivered by the fighting patrol helped give accurate locations to ensure that this was very effective. By early morning, uh, casualties in A Company were really high. Um, the C Force had been reduced to a handful of men commanded by Sergeant Stewart, who was later awarded a, a Distinguished Conduct Medal for his actions. Um, and basically, by the morning of the 27th, the C Force are starting to crumble and to retreat. Um, the Brigade Anti-Tank Company as well are starting to be pushed back. They've lost some of their guns and they're having to um, retire from their positions. The Seaforts attempt to have a counterattack. Unfortunately, this um, didn't get very far. It stalled in the face of heavy mortar fire. Now, that heavy mortar fire coming down and fire coming down on, on Hill 60, uh, I don't know whether you've been to Hill 60 recently, um, there's a bunker, main bunker on top, which has got a slit which faces east, just about. And there's a lot of damage around that slit. None of that damage is First World War damage. The bunker was intact at the end of the First World War. All that damage is caused by a Pac-38 during the Second World War, during this particular um, action. And the splinters of those shells uh, came through the aperture and mortally wounded um, second Lieutenant or Acting Lieutenant Sinton. Um, so at around about 6.45, the 17 Brigade Anti-Tank Company and the Sea Force are having to withdraw backwards. Um, so here we go. Right, let's spin on a little bit faster. Um, otherwise, we really are going to run out of time. Um, so um, during this time, um, there's lots of infiltration coming down through Fusilier Wood and across the railway line, coming in between B and C companies. Um, the trees obviously being quite young and dense undergrowth, make it difficult for people to keep in touch with each other. Um, and it's limiting the response of those Fusiliers to respond to anything. So simultaneously, a group's made along the railway line from the um, Seaforth's abandoned position. So it's coming from sort of the, um, the you know, the Zvartlin bit on that map coming south along there, along the railway line. Um, and they take up positions in the, um, the, the crater within the wood, overrunning the headquarters for um, uh, A Company. 
So it's not looking pretty, uh, it's not looking good at that moment in time. Okay. Um, and we are finding that under immense pressure, not only does uh, the Seaforths have to retreat, but also the inner skillings are coming back. And the reports from all sides that um, currently the Royal Scots View Resilience are on their own, um, which isn't necessarily true. Lack of communications, once again, infiltrating units coming right up to headquarters units and sniping at them makes you feel that actually there's no units to your left and right, but actually there are, but you can't see them. All you can see is enemy troops and hear enemy troops and feel the effects of those. So um, it really is looking pretty bad. Around about 10 o'clock, uh, attack by the 17th um, Infantry Regiment on the British 13th Brigade really began in earnest. Um, Jacques Cossart um, records that waves of German infantry were sweeping down off that ridge, uh, but unable to get over the railway embankment due to the heavy fire delivered by the Inniskillens and the uh, Manchesters. Now, somehow they appear on the other side of the railway line. Um, and for years and years, we couldn't work out how this happened until we found an account from the Germans. And then we found there's a culvert that goes, a tiny little culvert that goes underneath the railway line that takes a stream. And that's how the German units got through that um, culvert along a ditch that was dug in the canal and came in behind both the Cameronians and also the Seaforths. Um, so that's been reported back and then the entirety of the German forces are able to come in and start pushing them. And this causes the retreat the Cameronians and the, um, the Inniskillings. So they're being pushed back through Hollebeek um, and around about you know, midday, it's reported that Hollebeek is now in German um, possession. So um, they also find that, um, that around by one o'clock, things are not going well at all. And they're being told that um, A Company, B Company uh, and C Company must disengage from that front and withdraw back across the canal, otherwise they're going to be um, cut off. So if you go to the next slide. So as you can see, there are the infiltration coming through there. Um, what's interesting is another picture of um, uh, taken during the action is uh, medics from the 18th Division are actually picking up casualties. You can see there's the, um, it's a spoil bank cemetery uh, just there in the background to the right. Um, but they're collecting casual German casualties and also C4 casualties um, during the uh, the action there. Um, so um, during the, um, the the retreat out of the wood, um, Corporal Cowan is uh, is killed, um, coming out um, trying to get away, uh, and that's it's quite an interesting thing if anybody's interested in that area. Uh, is to be able to get hold of these temporary grave cards. Um, they're held in some of the parish records. And what they're really interesting is because they describe where that person was originally buried, after the battle, pretty much all the British casualties were buried where they fell. Um, so you can better understand where those people were. And it also describes what they were wearing, what was in their pockets, what their injuries were, a whole host of information. Some of it a little bit grisly, I'm afraid. Mm. But actually, the historical level is very, very good indeed. So um, we come to one o'clock on uh, the day of the um, uh, <sighs> yes, the situation one o'clock. So it's looking pretty bad. Being A and B company have been cut off. C company have got a limited window to uh, escape. D company are in a good position to cover them. Um, but the flank is looking particularly uh, bad on both left and right. Um, so after some minor adjustments, D Company has decided that they will cover the, um, the retreat and the fighting patrol backed up by Lieutenant Ian Scott Thompson's carriers will carry out a counterattack and alleviate the problems. So um, I think... 
I've got to click on this one. Is it a click on this one or is it a click on the next? Next, slide? next. There's no clicks on this one, I don't think. No click on this one. So it'll be on the next one. Okay. No worries at all. Um, yeah. Click onto the go onto the next slide. There we are. There's clicks on this one. Okay. So um, what we've got is we have uh, a counter attack which is formed of the fighting patrol and also the carrier platoon. So the, uh, it opens up with the guns from the Royal Artillery laying out a barrage along the road uh, between Hollebeek and Veranda Molen. Um, and this catches a lot of the Germans out on the road. And Jack Cossart mentions the fact that this causes uh, significant casualties uh, within the Germans. Once that barrage lifted, um, click. Uh, what we have is the Carol platoon uh, launch out of here straight into the wood and straight down that wide avenue, uh, taking the Germans under fire as they go. This is being led by um, Ian Scott Thompson. Um, also, there is Second Lieutenant Maitland McGill Crichton, who's the intelligence officer who delivered these orders. Um, he's involved in that. Unfortunately, as they're going down that, um, that avenue, uh, Maitland McGill Crichton is hit in the, uh, the head. Uh, and uh, is killed um, um, on the way through. So, next click. Here we go. Yep. Okay. Um, so as this attack goes in, the um, the the uh, the fighting patrol launches from their positions, um, and the the noise and ferocity is reported by the Germans at the time, the entire battalion had made this attack, rather than the 39 men of the fighting patrol and the uh, the carriers. Um, Second Chumley and his two sections accompanying uh, him assaulted the crater, which had been headquarters for A Company. German machine gun had been set up within there um, by the railway line. Unfortunately, it kills Chumley, Fusilier Boyd, and Fusilier Patterson, uh, before it's suppressed and destroyed by other members of the patrol. Company headquarters, um, that have all been wounded, have now they try and evacuate back down the uh, the road through Veranda Molen. Uh, B Company also under Captain Haish goes the uh, the same way, back through the woods, collecting the Manchesters in the farmhouse and towards the positions of the Northamptons on the bluff. So one more click, I believe. And oh, there we go. Yeah, brings you into this one. So it shows you the retreating motions. So A Company coming through Henry Kino's Cafe. Um, incidentally, they have to abandon, they carry Lieutenant Sinton that far, but unfortunately have to abandon him at Henry Kino's Cafe uh, because they can't carry him any further. But A and B Companies retreat back through um, into that location. Um, the C Company come back down through the inner skillings, collecting the skillings back down the, ba uh, the basin of the canal. And then finally, as is one of every single action here so far, the carriers make the, uh, the final um, uh, the, the backstop. Um, so there's lots of reports of the fighting patrol and afterwards missing men reports. Once again, I'm, I'm out of time on that one. So let's just keep rolling. Um, which you can pick up um, at other times. Um, so um, where are we? Right, okay, so they're meeting back through there. Um, many of the, so the, the guy who owns the farmhouse right in the middle, a guy called Joe, Jules Eid, um, he reports that um, many of the Germans and the Britons die along the railway in Van Bermond and Molen, Zwartlin and Verlingen, which is Battlewood, which is that big one there. Uh, many of the Germans are killed coming out of the forests and are mowed down by the British machine guns in the house of Jules Ild. Um, when that runs out of ammunition, they retreat in the direction of the canal. The other British machine gun, which is in the house of uh, Velinda, which is that one top left. So not the one in the middle, that one top left, that's it. Um, uh, was overrun by the Germans and the crew is all wounded. So it's nice to have these little snippets from the locals who are there because they really understand some of what's going on. OK, so finally, by three o'clock, 1500 hours, the carriers have come back down the road. They're back across the canal and that retreat is in good order. However, this is a, another brilliant photograph find by my friend Hugh. Um, what you see here 
This photograph here is a picture of the canal. Um, the track you see coming down in front of you from the top is the track that comes down the main route where those carriers come past. So you see the little map on the right hand side, the end of the Northampton shears. OK, you can see there's a track that runs down with a blue arrow. Sorry, that's right hand side. My apologies. Right hand side. That's it down there. OK, that is the canal. That is the pitch menu. That's the um, the retreating bit. And there is a um, report here that says um, the retreat takes place through the woods in good order, whilst the Bren gun carriers form a rear guard, protecting them like loyal dogs. Jack is a, is a bit of a, a flowery writer sometimes. <laughs> Um, the last carrier is now on the road back to the collapsed bridge. Its mission complete accelerates to top speed. It goes past the burning convoy and hooks into the fields down the slope. It heads down towards the pitch menu, which is the crossing of the canal. Its caterpillar tracks losing grip on the loose stones, and the tracks then bite the mud on the bank and it begins to rise again. They've almost made it. However, the hunters, which is one of the German units, have finally seen it from their positions along the base of the bluff. Burst of machine gun fire hits the driver that carries zigzags into the old bridge structure. It swerves, overturns, catches fire a few metres away in their trenches in the woods. The Royal Scots Fusiliers are unable to stop this tragedy. They rush to rescue the crew before they are burned alive. And that photograph is of that carrier um, in, in the winter of 1940, um, taken by the Germans who were there at the time, which is phenomenal to see. Mm articles of that uh, of the battle there and you can see the steepness of the canal and the fact that the whole bottom bit there was all just kind of like muddy morass um not an easy place to uh, to get things backwards and forwards mm. okay so those soldiers are members of 17 platoon second lieutenant livingston's okay because they retreated back and they're 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 um, looking at that. The carrier itself completely rolls over and that's what you can see in the photograph hitting the remains of the pre-world war one bridge um, carrier was really badly damaged, so it's left there until the winter. Um, and the driver of the carrier, Fusilier Milner, is killed by the German gunfire. One of the crew, Fusilier Wayne, who sadly was not identifiable and is only remembered on the Dunkirk Memorial, was also killed. Um, curiously, uh, Fusilier Milner's um, war records show that he was killed on the 10th of May. We know that's not the case because we, we got him there, we've got the records from there. But that's just recorded. All I can say is the fact that he wasn't um, potentially uh, fully recognisable and because of the, the, the battle that was going on, the records aren't complete, confusion. I see it so many times in their mm, records. Yeah. They're understandable, I think, um, in that. There was a lot going on, wasn't there, basically, yeah. yeah. Oh, huge amount. So, OK, so massive problems. Now, let's move on to the next slide. I'm sorry, we're probably going to overrun by about half an hour. Is that all right? Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, won't be fine. You can edit me down if you like. No, it's no. <laughs> they, they, they stand and fall as they are. I'm not never going to edit. No, that, this is it. This is the finished <laughs> version. That's no, good. Okay. So the problem faced by 17 Brigade is really severe now. Okay. Um, many of the soldiers are either killed, wounded, or already prisoner, uh, compounded by units retreating through each other, lack of communications about their intentions have meant a lot of the troops have retreated too far back uh, and they have to be gathered up and brought back forward. Okay. Um, so as this reorganization is taking place, German artillery is delivering heavy concentrations and it's just a, a real, uh, it's a real mess in this world. And you can see that 17th Brigade is out on a bit of a limb there. Yeah. Um, they really are occupying something that's uh, a little bit um, worrisome. So as they're coming back through, um, the uh, Lieutenant Livingston bustle says, you know, we've got to dig in to these woods now because we weren't expecting to, but now we've got to dig in. There are no shovels. They're having to use their hands, bits of sticks to dig in. And incredibly enough, they're walking through this wood and he says, we found a pile of brand new shovels, which seemed like manna to heaven to us. Uh, they told the men to dig in the best they could and wonder what to do with himself as the shelling was fairly heavy. Uh, ground is really hard and stony, um, but eventually self-preservation won and he got Fusilier McGann to dig himself, uh, dig him a hole. So um, <laughs> get somebody else to dig you a hole. It's the only way, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and they, they sat in that hole until dark, 
and watch machine gun bullets knocking the heads off of nettles a few yards in front of us. Um, and at this point in time, um, his platoon sergeant, Sergeant Dorking, was unfortunately shot in the head and killed. Um, so units like uh, 17 Brigade Anti-Tank had lost most of their guns. They are brought back um, and placed behind. Um, we have um, many of the other units in there. One more click on, actually. There we go. OK, we can see where everybody is starting to be placed. So we got the 70 Brigade Anti-Tank Company further back at a place um, called the Devil's Farm. And um, we also have various elements of the Fusiliers scattered around the Pine Beak Park. Um, let's say Livingston 17 Platoon uh, guarding the pitch menu um, and the ravine. Uh, with 18 platoon, they're all over the park there with the Northamptons further to the north. Um, but what is clear here is the Germans are already starting to come across and infiltrate behind the Northamptons, and they're already across the canal and starting to come in towards the pavilion. Photograph on the right-hand side there is um, where those lakes, you can see the lakes coming down through the map. Those are the lakes in 1939. You can see the woods are a little bit more mature, but not as good. So what was interesting um, was these is this whole area is being re-sculpted into a um, uh, a golf course, which means none of the lakes and none of the things are in the right place anymore. Um, so it's all a bit of a, a, a difficult place to walk around. Um, but at this moment in time, um, you can see the pressure is on. Um, the Germans are getting pushed right far up against them. So um, that afternoon, um, the German battalions are forming up in two waves, okay? And they're forming up in two waves along the, uh, around Hollybeek, um, and they are going to um, uh, put in a, a mass attack. Uh, 500 metres between the two waves. Um, the two waves are, are two companies, end to end so it's, a, it's one long line it's an interesting tactics germans in 1940 uh, very much that mass type battle um and um basically what they're doing is they're trying to push towards down to the white house and the pavilion um, as they attack the scots uh, respond they're firing uh, they're making sure that the artillery based near Parambeek, the anti-tank guns uh, are firing down on klein Zillebeek and also this other uh, attack from Hollebeek. Um, and, um, and luckily, uh, a lot of the counter-battery fire um, hits the farms around there and starts to destroy the buildings that um, have only just been rebuilt after the, uh, the First World War. Um, so... Um, where are we? Okay, so the plan commander uh, for the Germans deploys his men in the low marshy ground either side of the canal. So this is right down um, near 18 platoon, just to the right of 18 platoon, and they then start to move up through those woods. Uh, one of his bits here, um, he's got a, uh, a, a, a note, Lieutenant Zahn, um, he talks about that they find it very difficult going as the ground lends itself to a guerrilla style hit and run tactics, which the British are using to their disadvantage. I'm not entirely convinced that this was a, a specific tactic. I think what they were was just finding groups of retreating uh, British troops uh, and bumping into them and feeling that, that it was a, uh, a, a guerrilla style. It's more of a sign of British disorganization creeping in rather than some kind of plan we'll hit them with guerrilla tactics it's a yeah they're, yeah they're seeing something the wrong way yeah mm. yeah i i think that very much along that uh that sort of lines um so gradually the uh scots fusiliers and some of the inner skillings they would draw up the face of the canal under the tide of the german advance hoping to slip away um from the overwhelming force and rejoin the positions of the rest of the battalion in the park Unfortunately, a lot are captured during that um, movement. 
So this is reflecting in some of the notes from one of the German officers of the 11th of uh, the 11th Battalion. So he says, on the 27th of May during the afternoon, I crossed the Swamp Eepscom Canal with my second company. We were greeted at 300 yards by firing from the woods between us and the White House. I took cover with my scouts and crawled in their direction and saw a group of English moving into the wood to our front. Despite the weight of our equipment and weapons, we sprinted the last 100 metres and arrived breathless in our attempt to cut off the retreating Tommies. Uh, my three men and I crossed the wheat field, still under fire, but when we got to within 30 yards of them, they retreat. So what you can see here is as soon as there's pressure building up, because there's no communications, there's no leadership, there's nobody telling them to stay where they are, it's okay, the British are retreating for each time. He then takes uh, command of his first company and moves into the pavilion, which is the hunting lodge um, down, which you can see in, yeah, down there. OK, um, next slide. So by late afternoon, with the Germans now effectively on three sides of the battalion, um, Lieutenant Colonel Todd con tries to contact, or he thinks it's, it's important for him to contact the units on his left and his right, start evacuating casualties, order up resupplies, and to make sure that he gets around to all the four positions like a good commander ought to do so. So with reports of German troops crossing the railway line on both left and right flanks, Todd sends out members of his intelligence section in their carriers to try and establish contact uh, and evaluate danger. OK, uh, one of these is Slant Sergeant Bell, um, who goes on later on to deliver some incredible services alongside somebody called the Reverend Caskey. Hopefully people have heard of the Reverend Caskey. He's the Tartan Pimpernel. Uh, very famous guy, helps lots of British prisoners of war escape out of France and Belgium in 1940-41. But anyway, so um, uh, Lance Sergeant Bell um, takes up one of these reckeys. So he writes in his diary, um, we appeared to be fired upon from all around. Lieutenant Co Colonel Co Todd told me to do a recce in a Bren carrier, so with a driver and a gunner I moved off. Approaching the gate into the drive of a chateau, I saw a sh soldier lying in the middle of the road. I found him dead, and then bullets whizzed by and clambered into the vehicle, and we shot up the avenue and through an archway. Seeing a German soldier, I shot at him. Fortunately, I missed, and to my horror, saw the courtyard filling with Germans. It was an instinctive reaction for me to let the revolver drop from my hand, shove up my arms, and call my soldiers to surrender. So that courtyard is still there today. Um, it's a private house, so you can't go in there. But what you see is the uh, the pavilion there back in 19, uh, 1930s. Um, but it still looks exactly the same. And at the end of the battle, that's where all the prisoners of war are corralled and kept in the barns on either side of the pavilion. Um, so next slide. So the White House... Really thick walls, plenty of windows, held by the signals platoon under Second Lieutenant Knight. Um, and basically the Germans want that next. So um, their uh, notes uh, from uh, Lieutenant Zahn again. A uh, squad moves through the thickets, get ready to engage the enemy with grenades. However, a small garrison of the White House has guessed this manoeuvre and come out of the kitchen area and confront them. A battle in in Sauvages. Um, in which no less than 30 grenades are used and projectiles describe big arcs as they arch through the air, exploding amid the poplars, birches and pines. Scottish respond with a barrage of grenades themselves, and after a few moments of them crashing through the branches, the damaged trees sag and collapse along with the wounded and dying. The attackers are reinforced and the Scottish retreat. Suddenly, amid the clouds of thick smoke, they have disappeared, returning to the White House through the kitchen and the double locked door so basically it's a big thick building really easy to defend i'm not sure why the scott fusiliers decided to abandon it i can only presume that it was because it still had the family in the basement mm. i don't know um but basically what happens next is the germans um coming through the kitchen they surprise two of the um the, uh, the fusiliers still in the house trying to escape um, one of them uh, makes it out the window and runs up the, uh, the, the, the woods on the other side, unfortunately gets shot um, on the way through. That's Fusilier Dixon, um, who was killed. 
and the other one was um, just uh, was captured because he was concussed by some grenades. Um, when they took the photographs at the end, you could still see the um, frustrating. I've, I've not got those photographs, uh, but you could still see the blood stains in the house from the uh, um, uh, from the fight, uh, which was pretty um, pretty harsh. But the Germans that were killed in that fight uh, were buried in the um, uh, the the woods towards the pavilion or to the field towards the pavilion in the background there you can see the silhouette of the white house in the trees um so basically um he puts some sharpshooters in the small copses around the house um he also tries to get people up into the staircases unfortunately what is within the white house is it's got lots of windows okay and as they start to populate that house um there's a lot of light so they're silhouetted against those windows and the fusiliers were in the wood on the opposite side, open fire and cause a lot of casualties. OK, and in the end, what they have to do is they have to um, retreat back inside the building and close as many of the shutters as possible to get rid of the, uh, the light. Um, so they um, it's a it's a big old fight inside there. It's a it's a bit physical um, and. Eventually, the Germans take control of that building, placing machine guns in the upper windows. You can see within that um, top left hand picture, there are some higher uh, um, windows there. The big windows there are where the, uh, the staircase are. And then the winners left and right are where they put the machine guns to try and dominate the, uh, the Scots Fusiliers. OK, moving on to the next slide. So. As we approach the evening, things are, are, are really getting quite um, desperate. Uh, what Colonel Todd does is, because of the difficulty of communication with his forward patrols, he brings the entire battalion back into the Vergott farm as a wanna. Okay, and this allows a lot of the Germans to, to start creeping a little bit further forward. Um, so they start coming in and they are starting to surround. During that evening, um, they send out a couple of patrols. The first one is the 15, patrol, um, uh, 15 platoon patrol led by 2nd Lieutenant Wilmot. That bumps into one of the German patrols. 2nd um, Lieutenant Wilmot is wounded in the hip and he is eventually um, evacuated by Brigadier Stopford in his car. Um, but both of those patrols retreat out of there. And then a little bit further on, um, the carrier platoon is asked to do a disruption to try and stop the Germans from creeping any closer along the creek during the night. Um, and the patrol goes out. Uh, one side of that patrol under Lieutenant Thompson goes to the left side of the White House. Um, Sergeant Mafeet goes to the right side of the White House. They spin through the woods there, causing a lot of death and destruction uh, as they go. A lot of um, uh, basically stopping people feeling that they're comfortable and safe. The Germans start to retreat out of the White House and back to the pavilion uh, because of it. Unfortunately, during this, um, Mafeet gets back to the uh, the carrier um, and um, Lieutenant Thompson, um, his carrier doesn't. Um, his carrier, as it's coming along by the side of the lake, you can see in that photograph down on the bottom uh, right, you can see the carrier there slipped into the lake. As it's going along there, a lot of rain, a lot of wet area, uh, the carrier slips down and into the wood, into the, the lake there. Lieutenant Thompson and his driver and gunner have to jump out, swim across the lake and get back to the goat farm. So they have to abandon their carrier there. What is really, really cool is that when they were dredging the lake to make it into the um, uh, the golf course we see today, they took a bit of that carrier out of that lake. And you can see that along the um, uh, the canal uh, as part of the golf course. Wow. So it's still there, which is just phenomenal to know that that was Lieutenant Thompson's carrier. That's what happened to it. That's where it ended up. And the bits of it are still there. This guy, Thompson, if he had survived, I, he, he's a he, no, he's a legend. I'm lucky enough to know his sister um, really well and the rest of the family, um, who have given me a whole raft of information about him. Um, he just 
another inspirational person within that world. Brilliant stuff. Um, so basically, what we can see is that um, we are, are starting to contract back towards the farm uh, for a, a final stand. Um, and what's happening is we're trying to also just give ourselves some breathing space before the final um, uh, bits happen. So, right, next slide. So as we move after midnight, um, basically, um, Brigadier, Brigadier Stockford comes along, he turns up, he takes away um, um, uh, Lieutenant Wilmot and also takes away uh, Lieutenant Kenthorn, who have both been uh, wounded. Um, he tells Colonel Todd that we can't give way, okay? We've got to hold these positions at all costs, okay, to allow the BF to retreat the coast. Um, so he has got, he brings up a couple of replacement officers and uh, basically Lieutenant Colonel Todd says, no worries, this is where we're going to stand. This is our last stand. We are going to fight to the last man, to the last bullet here. We shall not go a foot back. Whether he actually said that or not, we don't really know. Um, but I really doubt he did because he wasn't that much of a dramatic person. Um, but it made good copy at the time in the, uh, the newspapers. Um, so here we are right at the very moment in time um, at around about 2.30 in the morning. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Todd extended the, the company, what was left of it, uh, and pushed out towards uh, back towards the wood, extending D Company back to the, um, the main uh, old white house in the bunker and C Company back into the woods at the side. However, it's not much longer from there. Around about nine o'clock, the Germans make their final attack across through the woods, um, through the Ossoir, the uh, Infantry Regiment 17, um, their 10th Battalion, their 11th Battalion, and their 10th Battalion take a part of this particular um, uh, attack, plus artillery and machine guns supporting fire from the 9th Battalion Infantry Regiment. Um, so we've got a, a, a lot going on. During this time, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Todd is hit and wounded and falls into that stream um, and is helped back to um, uh, the barn by uh, Lieutenant Cartwright. And also um, during these particular battles, as the Germans close in on the Vagot farm, um, Arkwright uh, has a, a grenade thrown at him. Uh, and Fusilier Laden, who's the guy uh, top left, um, catches that grenade and tries to throw it away, um, protecting his officer. And unfortunately, the grenade explodes in his face. Uh, everybody thinks he's dead, but actually he turns up later on. Uh, the Germans have done reconstructive surgery on his face and he survives the war. Um, his bravery was never officially recognised, but there's another person right there that, that, that stood on that line when they were called to do so. Mm. Um, so really, as it starts to collapse in on all of this, um, we have D and C Company. Um, one of the things that Lieutenant Livingston said in D Company was as the Germans were starting to close in a bit, um, his pistol, absolutely useless. Uh, he had one of the 0.38 caliber revolvers um, and he, was absolutely, he might as well have been throwing them at the Germans rather than shooting the Germans because it wasn't doing anything any good at all. Uh, they had hand-to-hand -hand fighting D Company in the in and around that bunkers, at which point during a, a bayonet attack from the Germans, um, W02, uh, the company sergeant major Rolf was killed uh, within the um, the doorway to the old World War One bunker. Um, uh, but pretty much they fought to a standstill within there at around about um, 11 o'clock, the um, uh, Todd eventually threw in the towel at the um, uh, for goat farmhouse because it was full of wounded um, and he couldn't do anything else. The ammunition had run out um, and at half past one, uh, Lieutenant Livingston and Livingston Bustle 
uh, and C and D company eventually um, surrendered. But these odds were quite um, overwhelming, really. And one of the incredible pieces of research, and these things happen from time to time, is that those two photographs we have there are ones that came up on a prisoner of war forum. And people were going, you know, where is this? We must recognize this. And I thought, oh, you know, I sort of recognize that. Took that to um, some of the locals. And they went, yeah, that's the pavilion. That's the Vagot farm. And so I put that up onto some of the, um, the, the, the forums that I have for the relatives of the survivors and said, what do you think? And somebody went, that guy there, that man, that short one looking at the camera, bottom right, that's my dad, that is. And I'm just quite, wow. oh, my word, that's just, wow. Um, I've been so lucky over the years to, to find people, find maps, find diaries, interview people, um, and collect all this information. I've only been able to touch the, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg, and my apologies for overrunning by half an hour um, today. But it's something that I, you know, it's a story that I don't think would be told otherwise, because we, as you said right at the very beginning, we concentrate on Dunkirk. We concentrate on that little miracle. But how is that a miracle? The only reason it happened was because people who were members of the Scots Fusiliers, the Cameronians, um, the Seaforths, the Inniskillings, the Northamptons, stood along that canal and held the Germans back for a couple of days to make sure that and it and it's a cliche but every minute counted you know every hour counted you know we we we, we talk about the 338,000 evacuated from the beaches and 40,000 left behind uh and we we simplify that 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 story of those who left behind we talk about the fighting on the hill town of Cassel and there's the there's the yeah. Calais the Calais siege and what have you but we we don't really go into much detail on it and and it's you know i don't like hyperbolic statements saying this set this saved the british army but you know every every bullet fired here every life lost every minute gained is is absolutely invaluable to what's happening on the beaches and and this has unfortunately been dropped a little bit out of the um, out of the, uh, the narrative i think yeah yeah completely and it was it was very clear when i first started my research on this that just nothing existed um, you know, there was few little bits here and there, and I was so lucky to come across um, Lieutenant or Major, as he as he is now, Major Livingston, Major Livingston retired, um, and he had this diary from Livingston Bustle, and from that we got some names, and from those um, bits we just tipped through all these bits and bobs. It was just so cool, and I, I say, at some point, we haven't run it for the last couple of years because of the COVID world. But at some point next year, it's open to absolutely anybody who wants to come. I run a, um, a, um, a battlefield tour. Um, all the relatives come along. It's free. doesn't matter. You just turn up, <laughs> go for it. Um, and we meet some of the locals, uh, people like Henry Brahm, uh, Frank Powell's, um, uh, you know, Annie Moon. Hopefully she's still around. And Hugh, all the people there that tell me a lot about things, all the relatives who have given me photographs of their Scots Fusiliers. You can see them all on the right-hand side there. I'd love to have 790 photographs at the end of my research. I've got about 260, which actually isn't bad, because I know okay. these were the people that stood along that canal. Considering we're talking 1940, not 1944, I mean, even people reconstructing some of the Normandy or the Market Garden era units, you know, it's not the British Army wasn't like the American Army where they had money to go and leave and get all get their portraits done. And most American units yeah. late in the war, they all had their portraits taken several times during the war. The British Army didn't do that. Less cameras in, in, in you know, the soldiers didn't own the cameras. You have the, some of the early war company photos, but I think it's amazing you've done what you've done. It really is, it really is, yeah, incredible. Um, we will wind things down a little bit. We just had a question there, but what happened to the Seaforth uh, guy who was court-martialed? Um, very good question. Um, I don't have the details on the top of my head, but what I will do is I will pass those on uh, and perhaps we can publish them in some of the materials in one of the comments 
Yeah, um, we'll do. We can do that. Yeah, but I, I do believe it went through, and um, I, I believe he ended up feeling the full weight of the court martial. Wow. So just to sum things up, you know, we, obviously, apart from those that were killed, that pretty much everyone else goes into the bag, isn't it? That none of these guys get yeah. back to Dunkirk, do they? Well, apart from the wounded that have been evacuated out earlier. Yeah, so um, those in the B echelon uh, transportation and areas did get back to Dunkirk. So a couple of those that did um, was Fusilier uh, Corporal Wilkie, who Brian is probably listening in at the moment. Um, fabulous guy. He's, he's, that's his father. He got back um, through Dunkirk. So 40 got to the beaches. Um, and eventually, after about four or five months, um, 250 got back to the UK which is quite phenomenal. Um, what's really quite weird, and this is another one of these unanswered questions, is that my grandfather, who was here at the time, disappears and then reappears to be captured in St. Valerie um, uh, in, I don't know, the 9th of June or something, or 12th of and That June. was kind of the last, final stand of the 51st High Division, wasn't it, it really, pretty much? Yeah. Two, three 300 miles away. Um, yeah. I can only presume that groups of them, when they escaped, they went, right, so where are we going? Well, we can't go back towards the coast because that's full of Germans. So let's look at the towns and villages that we, because they won't have a map, that we went through on the way here. So we're heading back towards Cherbourg and, oh, look, there's a unit there. Let's go. And they ended up getting back through. I don't know. I don't think anybody will ever know what happened there. Um, wow. All I know is that he spent the next five years as slave labour in Poland. Wow. Well, I, I kept thinking to myself during the presentation that every other battalion of every other um, brigade that was in France at this point needs someone like yourself doing that micro studying of it to build this story, to have this database there. I mean, the Dunkirk story, as great as it has been told, we know, we know that. We know all about what's going on the mole and the beaches there, but this is just such an important part of it. And yeah, sure, it's been two hours, but it's been two hours well spent, and I don't really care. It's been really good. So um, um, I just want to kind of finish off with this this idea of yeah, just thank you very much for your work and what you've done. And and I think it's weird. As soon as it came up, the maps at the beginning, because someone said they switched on and they kind of Vimy Ridge. I thought this is World War Two TV. I think in some ways the very fact that this action occurred in somewhere we associate with the First World War, Hill 60, Passchendaele, Messine Ridge, Eep, is that the what the 1940s story just isn't kind of thought of. If you're in that part of France, you go to Dunkirk, Cassel, maybe where some of the massacres like um, um, the Paradis and Wormhoop, that's 1940. But this bit, that's 1914 to 1918 and, and you kind of separate in your mind as the visitor we're, we're having a world war ii day now and then we're going to go on world war one day but actually there's a massive overlap yeah yeah and and the the, the crazy thing that um something that, that lieutenant kempthorne um says in his diary is that the training that they're doing is still first world war tactics and he was yeah. really frustrated with that because they're they're going into a, a modern conflict using the last war's tactics and yet the paradox is though they're going into it with the old tactics and yet because you said about the lack of shovels in that situation they haven't got the entrenching tools then because the british army were not issuing the entrenching tools because they, we're not going to dig in again they didn't have the shovels there you, you you that's what the difference is folks if you look at photos of the bef in 1940 and the british army in 1944 in normandy the guys in normally have the entrenching tools on the back of the webbing and they pretty much all have a shovel down the back behind their small pack because of that need to dig in and improvise fox holes and resistance. And there was this mentality, as we know, in the 1940s that we're not going to dig in again because look what happened last time we dug in. We yeah. were there for four years. So they're, they're fighting with old tactics, but they're also trying to move on from them. But paradoxically, they're getting it wrong in both counts, weirdly. Yeah. Um, Completely. Fantastic. Anyway, we will bring them in. So, Ian, well, it's been absolutely extraordinary. And we, we already talked before going online, folks, about maybe doing something about this with cameras on the ground the next year. So kind of go and go and study it with a couple of people up there on the ground doing some. I know you said the golf course has changed some part of the part of the battlefield, but we can we can do something up there. Maybe we'll think about doing that next May. Um, but brilliant. Good. I'll just remind people what we're coming up. And I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. So, folks. 
that draws uh, France in World War II week to an awesome conclusion. Uh, nothing tomorrow. Then Monday evening, two shows Monday evening, the, the incredible James Holland is coming on to talk about Fortress Malta. Then we've got another show late that evening talking about a film that is in the works, hopefully about the uh, the, the famous convoy uh, into Malta. That, that's, it's all on YouTube. Check it out later. And then next week, we're talking about the Mediterranean. So as usual... Uh, Ian's website in the description below. Think about supporting us on Patreon. Think about following Ian on Twitter, uh, myself on Twitter. Thank you very much for your attention and your 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 dedication to sitting and watching this tonight. But Ian, right now, all it means to do is say thank you very much for uh, for, for joining us. And um, yeah, brilliant, absolutely out, outstanding stuff. So um, I will see you. And, and folks, just don't forget, this is two hours on the fly live presentation. Amazing stuff. So Ian, credit to you, sir. Well done. Fantastic stuff. Brilliant. I just. Not enough superlatives. Brilliant. Okay, then. So this is Paul Woodhouse, World War II TV, saying I will see you all on Monday. Thanks for watching. Have a good Sunday.